in your life now, what are you focusing on? Are you focusing on what's missing or are you focusing on what you have? Are you focusing on what you don't want to have happen or are you focusing on what you dream of and what you love? This is Running For Real, the podcast for runners who know that for every runner's high, there are just as many lows. All those just missed PRs, easy runs that feel hard, injury blues, and more. Each week, we'll talk to running, health, and wellness experts about their highs, lows, and best advice to build our confidence. Running For Real is about being honest, being brave, and most of all, not feeling alone. And now here's our host, who knows the alphabet and American Sign Language, Tina Muir. Hello, my friends. Welcome to episode 90 of Running For Real. Thank you so much for joining me today. I am excited you are listening. If you are a new listener, welcome. I hope you enjoy this first episode you are checking out. If you are a loyal listener, thank you so much for taking the time every week to tune in every Friday. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. Now, last week I gave you a gift guide. Uh, I have this annual episode every year where I talk about the products that I am really enjoying this year. It often does very well with uh, other runners being that I do ask my Running For Real Superstars community for their input and uh, created a list of over 30 items. So be sure to go check out the blog post on my website, tinamuir.com, or you can listen to last week's episode to hear some ideas for the runner in your life or yourself if you are struggling with ideas. Now, today I'm talking to one of my absolute role models, and she is one of my favorite people in this world. I could not even believe I got her to agree to this interview And when she said nice things to me, like you'll hear in this interview, I could barely believe what my ears were hearing. Now, I'm guessing a big portion of you haven't heard of Siri Lindley or even Tony Robbins for that matter, but you need to look them both up right now. Seriously, I'll go wait a second while you go look them up. Just kidding, but seriously, go look them up. Tony Robbins has changed the lives of millions by now, I'm sure. And not just by saying something that made them make a small change, which kind of led to something bigger. I'm talking getting people off their butts to literally do something drastic right now to finally make something click in their heads. But back to Siri, I don't really don't need to give her as much of an intro because you're going to find out exactly what I mean in this episode. But who is Siri? Siri Lindley is the 2001 triathlon world champion. She now coaches many Olympians and world champion triathletes, including Sarah True, who is Ben True's wife. And you may know the name Ben True as he is a Saucony athlete who's run 1302 in the 5K. But what is so amazing about Siri's story is her journey to becoming who she was, starting at the very bottom, finishing at the very back of the pack. And I'm not just talking about the back of the pack within professionals, I'm talking the back of the back of the pack and how she rose to become world champion. She is transparent about her whole journey, the ultimate reel this episode is. And it's something that you won't hear from athletes at her level very often being as real and honest as she is. Now, before we begin, I just want to take a moment to thank Body Health for their support over the past year. As this year comes to an end, I'm starting to reflect back on 2018. And Body Health has not only been there for me this year, where my running wasn't exactly the priority, but I'm still trying to do my best, but they've also helped me for many years now. As I return to my running more, Body Health is there to keep me healthy, keep me recovering as fast as my body possibly can. And I just wanted to take a moment to thank them for their loyalty. If you want to use uh, code TINA10, you can get 10% off at bodyhealth.com on any of their products. As you know, my favorite is Perfect Amino. I will tell you more about that later in the episode. But I also want to introduce you a brand new sponsor. I'm very excited to announce that Mercury Mile are sponsoring this episode of Running For Real. And if you are like me, terrible at picking out running clothes to go with one another or even trying out new running clothes at all, Mercury Mile has you covered. After filling out a survey online, which is actually really fun in itself, I love doing surveys, or fun surveys anyway, not like the boring ones or the kind of ones that don't really have any impact on our life. This is a fun survey. They're going to mail you a box with an outfit that matches your style, your size, your personality, whatever you love. When in this box, you keep it. Whatever you don't love, you send back. It's that simple. And I absolutely love Mercury Mile. You can hear more about this perfect Christmas or holiday gift later in the episode. Now let's meet this inspirational woman. 
Ziri, I can barely believe I have you on the podcast. Thank you so much for joining me on Running Through. I am really excited to talk to you today. Well, I am so excited to be here. So thank you for having me. It's an honor to be on your show. Oh, thank you so much. And, um, you know, it's funny you saying that because one of my questions to you was going to be about how when the one and only Tony Robbins had you on his podcast and somehow, you know, he was complimenting you and telling you how incredible you were and you still spun it around to him and how, how great he was. So you just, you just make everyone you talk to so feel so warm and loved. And it's just, just one of your amazing qualities amongst many others. But I want to go right back to the beginning as this is a running podcast or not right to the beginning, but somewhat to the beginning as this is a running podcast. Some people I don't know who they are or where they've been hiding, may not have heard of you, but I want to kind of talk firstly about you being a three-sport athlete at Brown. Now, being technically a three-sport athlete, if you want to call indoor track, outdoor track, and cross-country a three-sport athlete, that's a lot of work, but they're they're obviously the same sport. Um, How did you find the time and the drive to want to do three sports while you were also in school at Brown, which I'm sure was no walk in the park in itself? Well, you're being so nice. So thank you for the uh, incredible compliments. I, I, I think you're amazing. So I, I appreciate that coming from you. Um, so yeah, I was at Brown university. I just, I played field hockey, ice hockey, and lacrosse. And for the first two years, um, my field hockey and lacrosse coaches were the same and they didn't want me to, to play ice hockey, which devastated me because it was kind of like my favorite, Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. that they had said to me that if I played ice hockey, it was kind of mean, actually, they were like, if you play ice hockey, we're going to do everything we can to keep you on the bench in field hockey and lacrosse. And I thought, well, that's just like awful. And at that point I was scared and I'm thinking, well, you know, I'm not going to give up two sports for one. So I guess I'll just do the field hockey and lacrosse. And then after two years, I kind of built up my confidence a bit and decided I was going to just take a chance and sit down in my coach's office and say, Hey, if you want to keep me on the bench, you go ahead and do that, but I will make it impossible for you to do that. I'm playing ice hockey. So I'll see you at practice or something like that. And ran out the door scared to death. And I just said that to this coach that terrified me. Um, but I really, you know, I miss ice hockey, like sports for me were my release, you know, my joy, my, um, I felt like it stretched me in a way that made me a better academic. It made me want to study harder. It gave me discipline. Um, So I really wanted to do it and I took a chance and fortunately they didn't keep me on the bench in both those sports. And I ended up being able to play all three, which uh, truly was such a a gift and a joy. And yeah, I imagine probably easier than running year round at that intensity. So (laughs) I'll give you that credit saying you were doing it just as hard. In, in some ways I think it was, but then I think in others, um, I guess, I guess field hockey and ice hockey are kind of similar. And I guess, I guess it's all kind of in the same ballpark, isn't it? With those three as well, but either way, very intense. And many of my listeners, um, were not college athletes and just kind of, uh, took up running or eat, a lot of them triathlon as well, uh, recreationally. Um, so I want to talk about that first triathlon that you did and, uh, you know, you, um, in this Tony Robbins podcast episode, which I guess we may as well start talking about right now, but the reason I first heard of you, um, believe it or not, Siri, I've, I, I, I'm a podcast junkie as, as most people who host podcasts are, but your episode with Tony is the only episode, only podcast or episode of podcast I have listened to not once, not twice, but three times because I just loved it so much. And, um, I'm going to put links in the show notes. If you have not listened to it, anyone listening, go listen to it as absolutely incredible conversation. Um, And one of the things that struck me just so early on was when you got on the phone with him, you were clearly like starstruck to even be talking to Tony Robbins. And just, just before we kind of go on to talk about that and then your triathlon, did any part of you feel that you should like rein it in and kind of act professional if you want to call it? Like this no. is a really silly example, but like I met Brian from the Backstreet Boys once and I love the Backstreet Boys as most of my listeners know. And I just was like, play cool, act cool. Even though like, I was just like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Um, when I met him and um, 
But you just, I, like, I just love that you were so honest and real and just kind of like, you were clearly in the like, I cannot believe I'm talking to Tony Robbins right now. Um, but you just said, no, you had no. Now, see, so this guy <laughs> truly with his book, Unlimited Power, I can honestly say he saved my life when I was 20 years old. Um, I was in a really kind of, um, I was at Brown University. I was playing three sports. I was getting good grades. So on the outside, it looked like I had it made. Mm -hmm. But on the inside, I was slowly dying. I, I was absolutely just riddled with anxiety. I was suffocated by my fears. I felt like I was a prisoner in my own body. And in order to deal with these feelings, I had developed this absolutely insane case of OCD that literally, yeah, I was that crazy person that took, you know, sometimes over an hour to leave my dorm room, depending on how many times I had to flick the lights and wash my hands and put my socks on and off before I felt that it was safe to go out the door. So nobody knew about this, but I was living my own personal hell. And one night in the library, I came across this book, Unlimited Power, and I basically read it from cover to cover. And, and what I learned, I mean, it was just, it struck me. It like literally woke me up to the truth that like, I'm in charge of my experience of life. Like I'm up to, life isn't happening to me and I need to step out and create the life I dream of by choosing what to focus on, choosing the meaning I give things and choosing what I do about it and not sitting back suffocated by my fear, but instead like doing something every day that scared me, not in an irrational way, um, but doing something that would challenge me to step out of my comfort zone and to take on things, to figure out like who I was and, and what I wanted to create in this world. And one of the things in, in that book that was just so powerful is that, you know, in your life now, what are you focusing on? Are you focusing on what's missing or are you focusing on what you have? Are you focusing on what you fear and what you don't want to have happen? Or are you focusing on what you want and what you dream of and what you love? Are you focusing on what you have no control over? Or are you focusing on what you have all the control over? And I made that shift in my mind that was like, I'm going to focus on abundance, not scarcity. I'm going to focus on what I love, not on what I fear. I'm going to focus on what I have all the control over, which is my experience of life. And with that shift, it literally, you know, breathed life back into me and so this guy, you know, I continued to read his books and listen to all his tapes and he had been such an influence of mine. And I was at the Ironman World Championships in 2016 and I coached Miranda Carfrey, who's like a multiple world champion. Mm -hmm. And I met someone from Tony Robbins' uh, team that was there with her father and she said, oh my God, can I get Miranda Carfrey to do a blog with us, our website blog? And I was like, sure, absolutely. And I begged Rainey to do it, even though she didn't know who Tony Robbins was. And, you know, I was stoked just to, that somebody in my life was going to be yeah. a part of something I did. And about a, a few months later, I got a call saying, we want you on our podcast. And I said, oh, you're looking for Miranda Carfrey. Let me give you her phone number. You want her email address? And they're like, no, we want you. And I'm like, What? I'm like, you want me? And I was like, so I convinced myself that like when they called me for this podcast, it was going to just like be as assistant and, you know, would just be kind of a generic thing. And I answer the phone that day and it's like, hello. And, and I hear this, hey, serious. Oh, Tony. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like freaking out. But if you want to know the inside story to this, which is like one of my greatest embarrassments is I had my video on like we do right now. And when he called, he didn't have his video on. Mm. And I didn't realize that if he didn't have his video on, he could still see my video. And this whole conversation, like he'd give me a compliment and I'd be like, oh my God, I'd be like pulling like, the hair off my head. I'd be like, <laughs> the looks on my face and I'm just freaked out. And they were watching this whole entire thing. When did you figure it out? 
Oh, like when I got off the phone and, and I told my wife that, you know, oh, it's such a bummer you didn't have his video on. And she's like, but you had yours on? And I was like, yeah. And she said, well, he could see everything you were doing. And I'm like, oh, my God, no. And probably on a big screen because it was probably like in a conference room or something. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, I love that. You know, maybe it led to him, you know, really... Uh, really knowing just how truly deeply grateful I was to him for, Mm. you know, just showing me the way to shift my own life. It was pretty amazing. So he's been obviously one of my greatest mentors and I am forever thankful to him, but it's just a dream come true to be doing what I'm doing now, being able to serve on this mission. Yeah that he's on and um it's pretty incredible so i feel very very grateful yeah and for anyone listening um siri is now a speaker at um tony's uh i don't know what you would call them i don't know if you call them you wouldn't call them a campaign but kind of a, a weekend i guess Events. Events. Yeah, like, uh, yeah. unleash the power within date with destiny has got these incredible conferences or um programs that are just uh truly life-changing and super yeah. fun and, and amazing and you don't just get to go siri is now one of the speakers and just heavily involved in it and that's definitely on my bucket list to go to one of those events so um i can't wait to hopefully time it with one that you are doing as well and i can go see you speak as well because those events just look incredible and the amount of people that say how life-changing they are there's they're just endless and uh your episode with tony is one of one of the most downloaded ones ever and actually if you go onto the tony robbins podcast um it on my phone at least it says best of and there's two episodes yours is one of them which is just so cool to see and um you know with that episode many elite athletes and i know this you know being an elite myself are very guarded you know afraid to show weakness you don't want to kind of talk about the things that held them back or the things that they're fearful of. Um, but you were very real, kind of shared it all, all the, all the struggles, not just in your career, um, as an athlete, but your career with, um, in your career, you know, trying to get a sponsor, you shared about, um, your relationship with Rebecca, all of it. What allowed you to be able to actually let down your guard and show people when most people within, you know, our world are, are very much kind of, Oh, I don't want to let too much out. Um, it all started, I actually, so I started writing a book about 10 years ago and I found that when I got to certain things in my life, I was unwilling to go there in the book. So I stopped writing it because I thought if I'm not willing to, you know, be raw and vulnerable, then this book will have no impact at all. And, and the only reason why I wanted to write the book was to be able to, touch people's lives in, in some way, impact them in a positive way. So about eight years after that, I was ready to talk about everything. And what I realized was that when we are, there's such a power in vulnerability. Said Brene Brown. Yeah. yeah, (laughs) You know, in sharing your story, your failures, your disappointments, your flaws, the things you've been ashamed about that ended up being your greatest strengths, like you are giving the message, you know, to younger people, especially that life doesn't need to look perfect for you to be able to achieve success in your future. Like I was the worst triathlete in the world. I was an embarrassment. I humiliated myself. I didn't know how to swim. I failed multiple times over and over and over again, but I rose to become the best in the world at one time. And I think it is so important for people to know that you can be flawed. You're not alone in your struggles. Um, You're not alone when you have OCD. You're not alone when you've had times when you weren't sure you could live another day. You're not alone when you're afraid that day after day you're going out and you're pursuing this dream of yours. And you can be afraid that that what if I don't make it? We all are thinking that. What if I don't make it? We all are thinking, what if I fail? We all are thinking, what if I'm not enough? Like we all think that way. And if we don't talk about it, then it really does seem to, to people that 
life has to be perfect. You have to be someone that's unafraid and that has no anxiety and no doubt. And that's how you succeed. Like that's not reality. Mm -hmm. It just Mm -hmm. isn't. And I'm a big believer that, you know, there is no road to success that is perfectly paved there. You're going to fail. You're going to be disappointed. There are going to be roadblocks. There's going to be U-turns and detours, but you know, it's through our failures. It's through our disappointments that we learn, we grow the most, and that's how we make progress. And now that my life has been one of, of falling often, failing often, overcoming, you know, struggle and, you know, stumbling upon my greatest strengths through my deepest struggles. Like I want to share that. So people know that that is, you know, that's what life is like. Absolutely. It's so, so important to me. And I feel that it is my responsibility to share my story. So so the book finally came out and um, it's called Surfacing from the Depths of Self-Doubt to Winning Big and Living Fearlessly. And I think um, I I really believe that there is a a great power in vulnerability and especially in athletics um, to know that you can fail first. It can take time but you can ultimately achieve your, your greatest dream, but don't expect perfection. It's yeah. not going to happen. I love that. And thank you so much for saying that. And, um, you know, um, I've been reading, I love reading self-help kind of stuff. And, and I've listened to the talk by Brene Brown called the power of vulnerability multiple yeah. times. Absolutely love it. And it's all about what you're talking about. And then also Angela Duckworth, I think that's her name, wrote a book called grit, which is pretty much exactly what you're describing right there, that it's not about the innate talent. It's not about kind of showing this perfect lifestyle. It's about, you know, like you said, falling, failing and just getting back up and and getting back on the horse. And, and I love that you did that. And, you know, um, I'm not, I don't want to rehash that same story of your, um, first triathlon, but you know, you did, uh, end up getting mixed up, starting near the front with the professionals, um, ended up finishing close to last. And, and again, you talk about this in the Tony Robbins interview, so I want people to listen to it there. But as you said, they're one of, I don't know if you were the worst, but maybe we'll say one of the worst <laughs> triathlons that you could have been yourself ending up world number one. But I don't want to talk about that right now. I want to talk about um, once you got into the trials for the Olympics, you threw yourself all in, you know, you got yourself an altitude tent, you visualized every day, which when I heard you talking about this, I thought, wow, this is me. Cause I've done visualization for, you know, six, eight weeks before like a big race and and I found it really effective but you talked about the other side of it which is where if you get too caught up in it has to happen this way and then this is going to happen and then this is going to happen and then this is going to happen and then one thing goes wrong and it all comes crumbling down because now your visualization is just off so I want you to um talk to people about you know what where's the balance between going all in as you did right there giving it your all visualizing every day, but then finding balance, um, you know, not getting too dedicated so that you lose touch with everything else. How can people find a balance with that? Because I think within our sport and within triathlon, especially people feel like they want to achieve something big and the harder they try, the more they commit, the more likely it is to happen. What would you say to that? Um, that's such a great question and, and I'll handle that in two pieces as far as the visualization. So for 365 days leading into that race, I had visualized the perfect race and the lesson, the major lesson I got from this, because the race started, the gun went off and within the first two minutes, everything was going wrong. And I had only visualized the perfect race. So I completely choked. I mean, I was going as hard as I could, but I wasn't even moving. I just kept getting past and falling further and further back behind. So the lesson here for me, and I share this with my athletes, of course, is you visualization is so very powerful, but within that visualization, we need to visualize things going wrong and handling them with grace and fixing the problem. Okay, I get a flat tire, so I'm calm, I'm relaxed. I quickly fix a tire, I get back on the bike, I've had a chance to have a drink and I take off and I feel better than ever and I start riding hard and I make my way to the front, whatever. Or, you know, you lose your nutrition in the marathon and, you know, but I remind myself, I have everything I need inside of me. I've I've had this happen before, I know I can get through it. 
So it's a matter of visualizing everything going right, but also visualizing any potential things that could go wrong and in your mind, seeing yourself executing a solution Mm -hmm. that sees you overcoming that struggle, that problem, whatever it is, and finishing the race, you know, the best that you can. I just want to add one thing in there. Another thing uh, element I add to that, just for anyone listening, is to kind of then envision yourself saying, well, look, you made it through that part. You did, you did okay. You know, that could have held you back right there, but you didn't let it stop you. And imagine yourself kind of saying to yourself, well, I made it through that tough patch. And sorry, yeah. keep going. And what can I do now? Yeah. What can I do now in this moment to make this best race that I can? Mm-hmm. So that was the, the big lesson there. But the other thing going into that Olympic trials is I had this thing, and I'm sure a lot of athletes can relate. I felt like I need to do this on my own. Like if I can do this on my own, then I'm going to be that much stronger, that much more powerful. So I moved out to Australia. I didn't let my family come visit. I lived like a monk, you know, I'd go to bed at like six in my altitude tent and I'm a lover. Like I love my, my family and my friends. I love connection. I love bonding. I love animals. And I literally was like stripping myself away from everything that gave me life, everything that filled my soul, everything that rejuvenated me, I was pushing away. And so through that race as well, I I rediscovered um, the strength and the power and the beauty of your team, whether that's your partner or your parents or your dog that you run with or your trainer that works on you, whatever it is, don't ever underestimate how very important your team is, no matter how small your team is or how big. Um, and that was another aspect, um, that was very important to me that I, that I made the mistake of there. Mm -hmm. Um, and lastly, I think, um, one of the most powerful lessons I got from that day, because I completely choked, I pulled out of the race. I quit. It was, it made me, it makes me understand now that not finishing is way worse than in last place. Um, but a lot of people, I was kind of meant to make the Olympic team. You know, I was like the second ranked American and everyone would come up and be like, are you sick? Did you have a flat tire? Was something wrong with your bike? And I could have very easily come up with an excuse. And I can remember in that moment thinking I can come up with an excuse, but this moment is going to change the future of what I can accomplish in this sport. I need to own it. And so my answer that came out was I choked. I absolutely choked. I had, you know, these expectations that were of the perfect race. And as soon as one thing went wrong, I I didn't know how to handle it. And I completely choked. And Owning that, owning that yourself is so incredibly powerful because it allows you to develop a respect for yourself. Mm -hmm. And it also determines your capacity to grow and to develop through the sport, mentally, emotionally, everything. The minute you come up with an excuse, you're stunting your growth. You're stunting what you learn from what happened on that day, whether we place blame, it's my coach's fault. They trained me too hard or it's my husband's fault. He made me a crappy pre-race dinner, whatever it is like blame gets you nowhere. Um, ownership gives you a deeper respect for yourself and also truly sets you on a path where you're going to learn and grow from whatever happened. And that is going to accelerate, uh, your movement, uh, through the sport. Is there a balance there that you can find though? Because like, do you ever think like, you know, it's very, it's very rare for people to actually own it. Like you said, it's very easy for us to say, oh, it was the weather or, um, you know, I ate something bad last night or something went wrong. But is there ever a point where you can say, you know, let's say it's, um, you're going for a, someone's going for a time. Um, and the weather is, it's 90 degrees, um, a hundred percent humidity. I'm going way extreme here. Um, and then someone can say, yeah, but the, you know, it, I can't blame the weather because everyone had bad weather, but they did have a goal in mind of a time. Do you think there is some kind of a balance where we can use a little bit of an excuse or 
is it always we should say, you know, no excuses. I am just, you know, it is what it is. Um, I'm just going to get on with it and move on. Um, I think that if it's a race where you gave everything you had, I, for me, my, the indicator of a great race, no matter what place you come in, no matter what time you do, because conditions can completely mm-hmm. time goals for me. I don't allow my athletes to hide time goals. I just don't because conditions can come into play and then they see they're not on target because there's 50 mile per hour gusts of wind. And as you know, as an athlete, even in that moment, you don't say, you don't have the perspective to say, Oh, it's 50 mile an hour winds. That's why I'm running slower. You're just like, Oh my God, I'm going like crap, you know, Mm -hmm. because there's no perspective in that moment. But my thing is that I want my athletes to cross the line knowing that they gave everything that they had in each moment, mentally, emotionally, and physically. So if on any given day they gave up on themselves or they gave up because they weren't in first, second, or third, no, I'm not going to listen to the heat or this or that because everyone is dealing with it. And it's a matter of just owning, like, did you give it everything you had? Did you stay as strong as you possibly could? Did you do the best that you could mentally, um, with everything else that had happened, you know, in your personal life going into this race? And if you did, then that's a successful race. And it's not to say that you can't say, oh, it was, wasn't, wasn't my best day, Mm -hmm. but Anytime we put the blame and especially, you know, when athletes will put a blame on their coach, which as a coach, um, that's always hard. And I will absolutely own if I have done something that I believe is had a negative impact on an athlete. But I think your growth as an athlete, your um, acceleration as an athlete, the more we can own everything about our experience the more we can take full responsibility for everything that goes into getting us to the start line and getting us to the finish line, the more powerful of an athlete we'll be. And the more powerful, you know, the more likely we will be the fearless leaders of our own lives outside of the sport as well. And that's necessary for creating extraordinary lives. So I don't want to sound like a bitch, but I don't like excuses. No, I'm the I'm the same way. But I, I the reason I ask you that is because often uh, my husband is my coach as well, and I'll come back from something and I, I'll say, oh yeah, that, I mean, I did my best, but it wasn't as good as I hoped. And he'd say, yeah, well, you know, it was like you said, 50 mile an hour wind gusts, so you can't expect too much. And I'd be like, I'm not using that as an excuse. It's not an excuse. And and so he's like, no, you know, sometimes you can say the weather wasn't great. Um, So I've kind of gone the other way. But that I know that people do struggle with excuses, which is another reason, you know, I wanted to ask it. And related to that, you know, you've talked extensively um, in various places about living in a place of fear. So maybe you could explain, you know, what that means by you were originally living in a place of fear and now you live um, in a place of love. So how common is it for people to be living in fear and what does that look like? Well, depending on how extreme that fear is, I mean, for me, it looked, you know, my future was was dim. I I didn't have uh, much will to live. I was so afraid all the time. Um, But... Living in fear means that we don't take action because we're afraid of not being enough. We're afraid if we're not enough, we won't be loved. And therefore we don't even try. And fear is something, I mean, to me now, I've just changed the meaning I give fear. In the past, what I feared were all things that I had no control over. So I had to come to terms with, okay, you can be afraid, but be afraid of something that, you know, is rational, not irrational. Like, don't be afraid of things that you're creating in your head. You can be afraid if, you know, a big snake comes and wraps itself around your neck. That's fine. But fear is what keeps us in our comfort zone. And I change the meaning of fear to being anything that scares me is the universe saying, take this on. This is going to lead you somewhere amazing. So just like step out of that comfort zone be afraid, do it anyway, because what is, you know, when you're afraid and you do it anyway, that's courage. 
And we all have courage inside of us. It's a decision to say, I am going to be courageous. Mm -hmm. I am going to dance with my fear, use it as this is, it's scaring me because it's exciting. And I know it's going to take me somewhere way better than where I am now. And I'm just going to be courageous, step out of my comfort zone and try. And others respect courage as well. So you're going to get the support of other people. Absolutely. And, you know, really, if you think about it, how can we ever know what we're capable of if we're not constantly daily trying to do things that we don't think we can't? Mm -hmm. Like if you're not trying to do what you don't think you can, how will you ever know what you're capable of? You have to. So it's coming to terms with that and saying, okay, I can be afraid. You're going to be afraid. I'm not going to sit here and say, you're never going to be afraid. Like you're going to be afraid, (laughs) but how about we change the meaning to this is a great opportunity to stretch myself and to, um, step into the unknown and really be able to see what I'm capable of and how great life can be Mm -hmm. outside of my comfort zone. So two things to that. One, what if someone is listening and thinking, um, yeah, but you know what, if I, if I do this and I, you know, I dance with the fear, I take on my fear, um, you know, I, I don't know what's going to happen and that might affect me and my family. And, you know, I have a job or I have a home to pay for, or I have this or I have that. And kind of, again, coming up with excuses, what would be your answer there? I would say it's a lot more scary to end our lives at 90, a hundred years old, um, feeling like we hadn't done anything and knowing that we could have inspired those around us that we love and care about to be courageous and to take a chance on you and to believe in yourself and to, you know, stretch yourself. Like, I think it's a lot scarier to think of living a life where you never left your comfort zone, where you never, um, seeked to find just how powerful you are. Cause we all as humans are so incredibly powerful and we're all so incredibly beautiful. Like, like we were put on this planet perfect, just the way that we are. But if you're not getting out there and, and being courageous, how can you ever experience that true gift? Uh, which is you. So I would just say there's always going to be a risk, but you know, life is all about change. Like nothing in life stays the same. Life is constantly changing. We need to get comfortable with change. We need to get comfortable with risk and and doing things that scare us because life is going to, life is going to come and things are going to happen. And if you're constantly trying to shelter yourself Um, you're not really building that muscle to be prepared for when something does happen that you don't want to have happen, but you have no choice but to go through it. Absolutely. I love that. Thank you so much for explaining. And, and, and one more thing related to that, you know, um, you've talked about, um, changing your mindset from what you have to do to, you know, uh, the opportunity to compete being that you want to show thanks. Now, I know many of my listeners get into the point where I have to run this time or I have to finish in this place. I have to get a Boston qualifier. How can they change their mindset to to do, do it the same kind of thing that you talked about, showing thanks rather than feeling like have to? Yeah, um, I can remember specifically during my career, it was in my last two years, which were really my most successful years. And I made this mindset shift and it went from being, I have to do this and I have to win and I have to make the team and I have to get a paycheck to, I was sitting one night looking out at a sunset in Switzerland. And I thought, you know, how lucky am I that not only do I have two arms and two legs and this strong beating heart in my chest, um, but I have this desire and this will to like push myself every day to, to see what I'm made of and to get stronger and to get faster. I have this will, I have this passion, I have this desire. I have people that are supporting me. I have the best coach. I have great training partners. And I thought this is such a gift. And I, um, I'm very spiritual. I believe in God and it doesn't, I'm happy. Anybody listening, whether you believe in God or the universe or whatever it is, infinite intelligence, whatever it is you believe in, I felt I had been blessed with this gift and I was so desperate to show my gratitude 
for these things that I was appreciating in that moment. Mm -hmm. So desperate to show my thanks. And I thought, well, the best way that I can possibly show my thanks is to get out there every day and especially on race day and use everything I have inside of me to the fullest to say, I recognize that I have this will, I have this courage, I have this strength, and I'm going to show you how much I appreciate it by using all of it in every moment. Um, so for me, it became a way of showing my thanks for what I felt so grateful for. Now, maybe some people can't relate to that, but another way of looking at it is saying, yeah, I have, I have these talents, these abilities. Um, how about the, the Prefontaine quote? that says uh, to give anything less than your best is to sacrifice the gift. That's basically what I'm saying with, with how my approach changed and looking upon it as an opportunity, um, a gift. You're in, what, what is your performance um, doing for others? Well, you're inspiring others to dream big and to push themselves and to go after a big goal, even if they're afraid, mm -hmm. um, to be willing to fail, to be willing to fall. Like if you think about it outside of yourself and more a way of showing thanks or a way of inspiring others, I think it will bring that much more out of you and take more of the pressure off. We become so obsessed with ourselves and it's not necessarily the most powerful space to race from when we're just self-absorbed. Um, you'll find so much more power when you make it about something more than yourself. I love that. I love that. And that also helps with, um, you know, I was going to ask you about, um, finding a balance between what we talked about earlier and, you know, becoming obs essentially obsessed with your goal, kind of making it everything in your life. Um, but when you do what you said there, making your purpose, something bigger than yourself, that kind of removes that as well, because it's not, just about kind of trying to prove yourself. You're trying to help others and show others as well. So I love that so much. Now, one last thing I wanted to kind of cover one area was um, hunger or grit, which you have clearly shown you have a lot of um, through, you know, what you've managed to accomplish through this conversation, the things that you're saying. The ultimate question for you that I've been wondering, can you teach grit? I think that it's innate within every single human but tapping into it is the thing that is the necessary component. Mm -hmm. And you tap into your hunger by having that deeper purpose, that greater why behind what you're doing. You know, you often hear of people, they set this big goal and they achieve it and they're like, is that it? You know, they don't feel fulfilled. And I think a lot of times that's because they aren't really connected to the deeper why behind um, their whole pursuit in that area. You know, for me, uh, as an athlete, I was on this desperate mission, number one, to find out who I was and to find a love and, and an appreciation uh, and a respect for myself, which I hadn't had, you know, for 23 years. That was so incredibly important to me. And I knew that every time that I could overcome failure, I could overcome my fears, I could take one step closer towards achieving this impossible dream I'd set for myself, that I would develop an appreciation for myself and ultimately a respect for myself and ultimately a love for myself. And that's a pretty powerful why. Yeah. So when I accomplished that ultimate dream, like, yeah, it was cool and amazing. I was world champion. I was world number one, but honestly, it wasn't about that. It was that finally for the first time in my life, I had given myself the gift of my own love. And when we have a deeper purpose, whatever it is, you know, some of us, maybe we've lost someone that we love that believed in us and believed that we were going to achieve something spectacular and we're doing it for them. We're doing it to say, I'm, I'm living this life for you. Your strength is in me and I'm doing this for us. What any kind of a greater purpose, a deeper why, when you connect to that, um, when it's not just about making a paycheck, but it's about, I want to make a paycheck because I have a family that I want to, I didn't have a great childhood, but I want to be able to give them a childhood where they're supported. They're getting a great education. They're getting, 
you know, they can live and grow and whatever, like that deeper purpose, when we can connect to that, it develops a hunger that no matter what gets in your way, you will not stop Mm -hmm. until you achieve what you're trying to achieve because there's a deeper meaning. There's a greater purpose. It's a, it's a much more powerful mission than something surface. I hope that makes sense, but my hunger comes from a desperation to finally love myself Mm -hmm. and to feel worthy of this gift of life. And, um, so, yeah. No, I, I think that. that makes sense. And I think that is something that we all struggle with. And I know a lot of people listening def- definitely struggle with that. And the, the recreational runners listening, you know, maybe you're not trying to make a paycheck, but you are, you want to show your, your kids or show, um, you know, your brother, your sister that um, you can work towards something, you can dedicate yourself to something and you can achieve it. And um, you could, you know, use it to inspire other people for, for different reasons, even if it's not quite to the level that maybe Siri or or I might run at you, um, you still can kind of use that same concept yourself, which I love. And then what about, and also, can I add one thing to that? Like the recreational athlete, like they're, you know, showing that they care about their health and Mm. their vitality and they want to have the energy to, love their family and stick around for their family and to make a difference in the world and to be able to do more and create more in their lives. Like there's that kind of a deeper reason, which is, you know, I want to be healthy because I have a young daughter and I want to be there at her wedding. I want to be, you know, whatever it is. So yeah, sorry. I just wanted to No, 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 you're you're fine. And then one, no, I'm glad you mentioned that. And one other thing related to that for people who maybe are recreational runners, but they do have goals and they feel like they're, they're weak, that they're not gritty, that, um, you know, they want to be better, but they're just mentally not tough enough. Would you say that's a real, you know, someone who really needs to kind of, like you said, look into that why and figure out something that is going to help you dig deep when you are in those tough moments? That absolutely. And also saying, Hey, you don't think you're tough enough, but you're doing it. Yeah, You're not lying on the couch. You're not, you know, not even taking that first step. You're out there doing it. I'd say that that's brave and courageous and freaking amazing. So ask yourself better questions too. Like I'm telling myself, I'm not tough. I don't have that hunger. Well, you've got your run shoes on, you're outside, you're going for a run. You're, you're like, that's grit. That's hunger. Mm -hmm. So it's appreciating yourself and giving yourself credit. Like it's never, yes, I achieved a very high level, but it's never been about first, second, or third for me. It's been about being better than I was the day before. And as long as I was striving to be better than I was the day before, I felt like I was worthy of saying, you know, I'm tough. I'm getting it done. I'm courageous. I'm brave. Um, give yourself credit, appreciate yourself. And that's the key of all is recognize and appreciate I you. I love that so much. Thank you so much. And, and just one more question to wrap up before we get to the, just the quick final four is a question from my good friend, Elizabeth, who I know is a huge fan of yours. She wants to know, can you teach athletes to race? Um, is it competing? You know, can you do that over time or is that kind of a skill that people learned? What would you say just about racing in general, based on, you know, the athletes that you have worked with at the very top level? Definitely. I think everybody can learn how to race. And it's a matter of no understanding that everybody is unique mm-hmm. and what motivates them, what's going to bring about their best, fastest effort, you know, in a race mm-hmm. is going to be different. And I always take it back to, there was a year at the Ironman world championships where I had five of the top 10 athletes in the world were my athletes And the day before I'm giving them each their pre-race kind of pep talk type thing. And you would have thought I had like 10 different personalities (laughs) because the way I sounded with each athlete was totally different because what motivates each one of them is different. What drives each one, what influences each one, um, everything is different, how they handle stress, how they look upon the race. Some see it as a celebration of all the hard work you've done. Um, some see it as this is a test I need to measure up. So yes, it's a matter of really, if you're thinking about teaching yourself how to race, what drives you, what influences you, what is going to bring out the best in you, 
understand who you're trying to teach how to race, understand the human, um, and you'll figure out the strategy to learn how to race. And I could, I mean, that that's a conversation of a couple hours, but yes, everyone can learn to race. And that right there, my friends, is the sign of a good coach. Uh, what Siri is just described right there. If you are looking for a coach in the future, Siri just proved the points that um, are good to have someone who actually takes the time to get to know you as an individual and understand your strengths and weaknesses. Um, so uh, get some wisdom there from Siri. All right, we're just going to take a moment to thank our sponsors and we'll be back with the Running For Real 4. You enjoying these cool mornings? How about the intense workouts that are just as hard as they always were? I don't know about you, but I always feel like workouts are going to be somehow easy in the fall after a hot summer, but they're still, well, hard. I still feel beaten up after hard days and after long runs, and I still get sore the next day, but are less sore when I have Body Health Perfect Amino to speed up the recovery process. I take a lot of comfort knowing that it is working hard to repair my muscles as soon as I stop running or strength training. Then I can eat my meal, my usual 25 minutes later to fuel up again. I wish I could say I used that time to stretch, foam roll, do mobility and rehab, but let's be realistic, that doesn't always happen. Usually I'm jumping in the shower and trying to get clothes on before Bailey starts crying or I have to do something else on my list. At least I know Body Health Perfect Amino has my back right from the stop of my watch. If you don't believe me, you can try Body Health Perfect Amino with 100% money back guarantee. So if you don't like it or you can't see a difference, you can get your money back. Use coupon code TINA10 for 10% off everything at bodyhealth.com. And if you aren't a fan of the tablets, they also have Perfect Amino XP powder and there's a new mixed berry flavor to try. Remember, code TINA10 will get you 10% off at bodyhealth.com. Wearing running clothes that are comfortable, stylish, and of course functional can make all the difference in the world. We've all had the experience of wearing something that is clearly not made for function and ending up with chafing so bad you get in the shower and have to stifle your scream. Or is that just me? I had always seen those personal stylist boxes where you get a stylist who picks the slack up for those of us who are not exactly gifted at choosing an outfit. But there was one problem. They were all for people who, well, look stylish, like they belonged on a TV show in New York. Except I don't wear those clothes, as they may look nice, but just being real, I'm never, okay, really, going to wear them. Active wear, I live in it. Mercury Mile fixed that problem, and all you do is fill out a 10-minute survey all about your style, how loud you would like your clothes to be, your struggles with running clothes, brands you like, brands you don't like. It's a fun survey to fill out, and at the end, your personal stylist will send you a box of running clothes to wear. The items you love, you keep. The items you don't, you send back. And then they charge you for what you kept. It's that simple. Running for Real fans can get $10 off your first box using code TINA10. And this is the perfect gift for runners in your life with a reassurance that they're going to love it because running clothes are chosen for them and match for them. Or if this is you, let this part of the podcast play on repeat with your loved one in the room until they get the hint. Go to mercurymile.com and remember to use code TINA10 for $10 off. I love it and you will too. All right, Siri, just four more quick questions for you, starting with, can you tell us about a photo, maybe on social media, maybe it's from the past, that isn't quite what it seems? Something in the past that isn't quite what it seems. Well, I think just going back to that initial story, you know, on the outside, it looked like I had it made. On the inside, I was slowly dying. You know, we can easily, a lot of us can look happy when we're not. Yeah. What about a, I call it a running for real moment. It can be about running or it can be a triathlon for real moment. Something that only runners or only triathletes will kind of get. The rest of the world who doesn't really compete won't get it. Um, as I run, running is still my favorite thing to do in the world. Um, I love running on trails with beautiful views. And a beautiful view could mean anything. It could be anywhere in the middle of a city or out in nature, but I love that moment when you take, you know, it's 10 minutes in or so, and you start really feeling the, the air coming through you. And, um, I get very spiritual and I start thinking about everything that I'm grateful for. And my appreciation, um, on a scale of one to 10 million goes to like 20 billion just for being alive and the gift of life and the gift of movement. So, I'm sure there's a lot of you that can relate to how um, 
running brings you into that truly grateful mm-hmm. space um, where you can appreciate everything around you. Absolutely. Love that so much. What about a high moment for you? A high moment? Mm-hmm. Every day being alive. Now, I tell you what, really, I mean, now that I figured out and I made it through my, you know, that biggest struggle of my life, every moment of life is a gift. And, you know, we can always look for what's wrong, but there are 10 million more things that are right. And um, it truly is a gift to be alive. And so, yeah. I love that answer so much. And finally, what do you tell yourself on the start line of a race or what did you tell yourself? God, that's a long time ago. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to do the, it's kind of what I say to myself now before I go on stage, I'm going to do the best that I can and come from my heart. That's yeah. the perfect thing to say. All right, Siri, <laughs> if people want to follow you in future, where is your favorite place they should go check out? Well, my greatest why right now is BelieveRanchAndRescue.org. My wife and I run a horse rescue. Um, you can follow us on Instagram, Believe Ranch and Rescue, or on Facebook, Believe Ranch and Rescue. Um, and of course, I'm on Instagram, Siri Lindley, and on Twitter as at Seltz, S-E-L-T-S. And on Facebook, so you can follow me, but follow Believe Ranch and Rescue first because that's far more important. Okay, I will definitely put links in the show notes to those so you can go find them, go follow Siri. Siri, thank you so much for this conversation. Absolutely exceeded my expectations and they were very, very high to start with. So thank you so much for your time and for sharing with us today. Thank you for having this amazing podcast. I so appreciate it. You're wonderful and it truly was a great honor. So thank you. My friends, if you have a minute and you could leave a review on your favorite podcast player, Apple Podcasts, aka iTunes, Stitcher, Overcast, Pocket Class, Spotify, or whatever else podcast player you use to listen to this podcast, or if you would subscribe to this podcast, you will help me get out in front of new runners to make our tribe even bigger and even better. It might not seem like you as one person can make a difference, but really it helps a lot. And it shows me you appreciate the hard work I put in for those. Thank you so much. Well, was I right or was I right? I thought this would be one of those interviews that I would reflect back on many years to come and go back to over and over. But Siri exceeded even my high expectations. How about the perspective she has? A zest for life, the love, the passion, all of it. No wonder she's such good friends with Tony freaking Robbins. Uh, He is absolutely amazing. And remember, if you haven't heard of him before, go listen to that episode with Tony Robbins and Siri Lindley on his podcast. It will make a difference in the way you see things in your future. It definitely did for me. And that's why I've listened to it three times already. There will be links to that episode, all the links Siri talked about and everything else we mentioned in the show notes at tinamuir.com forward slash episode 90. And I hope you enjoyed this episode. Remember, there are a few ways you can give back to me. You can take a screenshot of this episode that you've been listening to. You can tag me and my guest, share it in your social media so others think, oh, I'm going to go listen to that. You can support me by purchasing one of my sponsor products. You can also show your support by tagging that sponsor um, in your social media when you enjoy their products, saying thank you. So they want to keep investing in me. And you can support me on Patreon if you choose. That is helping to get everyone a bonus episode once a month. So if you go over to p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash running for real, you can find more about that. There's also in the show notes as I know I said that pretty fast. So I hope you have a wonderful week. I'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to the Running For Real podcast. Be sure to check out tinamuir.com for show notes and even more helpful running information.